Welcome to uh, Second Life for Professional Development and Education, and we're going to look at the expectations and outcomes and implications for music educators and arts professionals. Uh, so first, are, uh, introductions uh, in who the is areas this Kate of audience how did she find Second Life? And, uh, professional what has she been doing in virtual for, world? Uh, musicians. musicians 2006. Thank you for joining uh, me today. Miranda and is the find uh, virtual uh, and, uh, avatar. Uh, I'll Linda try to get Rogers, through, uh, a lot of content who, uh, and is uh, not an academic but has uh, worked in um, Thank you. Uh, the professional arts world since uh, graduating with a BFA in uh, theater production. Uh, I've worked um, mainly in um, orchestra and opera and new music organizations. Uh, as um, a general manager and also as an um, education uh, director. And I have a lifelong interest in the role of music, of, of education in the. Uh, when I came to uh, Second Life in 2006, I found it via uh, Howard Rheingold's uh, Brainstorms community, if you're familiar with Howard, who was the science and technology writer of, um, of some note in the old whole Earth uh, catalog days, um, and has always been a, a leader in the internet. He had, a, a, well, it still exists, a forum um, online, and I was a member of that community. And People started talking about uh, sec Second Life back in 2004, and I wanted to investigate. And I found the Cedar Island Collective, which was a group of educators and lifelong learners who were um, putting their resources together in a community that was an amazing place for about six years. Um, in addition to Music Island, there were many educational projects that uh, were launched there. And uh, this is a small group uh, presenting a seminar in the wonderful lodge setting. Um, music, uh, my own project was in music. And so I learned about um, uh, the affordances in Second Life for, for music. And I identified a gap that existed for professional and classical musicians that I met in Second Life, which was that there was a wealth of venues, there still is today, for uh, social music. There's bars and clubs and, and uh, beachside dance venues and so on. But they're mainly for popular music, a lot of people doing karaoke singing, cover bands, and so on. And there are also concert halls for role play, which didn't afford themselves for, neither afforded themselves well for serious music practice for a number of reasons. Um, the uh, historical uh, clubs, uh, historical palaces and concert halls and so on, were oftentimes um, had very rich textures. Sometimes they occurred on residential uh, homestead sims, which only had a capacity of 10 avatars at a time. So the large capacity was not there one way or another because it's all bandwidth in Second Life. Uh, you can expand the bandwidth in rich textures in many animations or um, in uh, uh, avatar capacity, but they all uh, are bandwidth. So we uh, designed a very simple uh, venue uh, that was very functional in nature. The uh, Music Island uh, um, of 2006-2012 was uh, much appreciated by musicians and members of the public for its rustic look. And over time, we collected flags, uh, as you can see here, for the various, uh, representing the various resident musicians who performed at Music Island. And uh, at, at total now, we're at 18 flags. It was hard to say goodbye uh, to Music Island and uh, the Cedar Island community. 
uh, virtual places have, find a place in our heart as easily as real homes do. But um, the musicians and I got together and said, um, now that Cedar Island is closing, do we stop uh, performing? Do we stop this venue or do we look for a new home? And we decided to look for a new home and we contacted colleagues and friends and said, we'd like to continue our series. Uh, can we find a collaboration with you? And we were fortunate that we did. We moved to Vertlantis, which is a, uh, a language uh, school uh, simulation. They mainly use their facilities during the weekend and, or the weekdays. And so on the weekend, uh, uh, the capacity is there for us to mount our series. So we have a very simple arrangement that um, we will uh, stay in touch. And if we need the facilities during the weekday, we'll get in touch with them. And if they need it on the weekend for something that they're planning, they will schedule around us. So that has been working very, very well for us. We, we no longer have the two sims that we had at Cedar Island, but um, with advances in the technology and, and that we don't really find it necessary in the same way that we did in 2006. What are the reasons we found that various uh, professional musicians and music educators come to Second Life? Well, honestly, there are as many reasons uh, as there are musicians. Uh, but one thing we have noticed is there is a serious disconnect between what Linden Labs promotes to musicians as this is the reason to come which is to promote yourself, to market your, um, your, your CDs and so on, and the actual affordances of Second Life, the small audiences and, um, and uh, small market share of any one Second Life concert doesn't really lend itself well to promotions. And many of the musicians that are performing in Second Life certainly have no need to uh, promote themselves in this way and are using uh, virtual reality in very different ways. So where, what are they doing? Well, some are developing new material or uh, using it to pre prepare for a particular uh, performance. Um, virtual concerts uh, give musicians and music students also a live and responsive audience to try out new material. You can rehearse something at home, but it's not the same as the, the, the pressure and the feedback that you get from a live audience. Music Island uh, partnered in the beginning with a Swiss uh, conservatory professor, and he had his students give Second Life concerts prior to performance exams. And it was interesting that all students in this program passed their exams this year. The, he would ideally have them perform two weeks to a week, you know, 10 days or so before they were doing the performance exam. They often found that what they thought was secure was not secure. Pieces that they thought were rocky gave them no trouble. And so they were able to zero in on those things that needed to be fixed. And he did this um, mainly via uh, video sharing as opposed to uh, avatars in performance, although he did some of both. And here's a video of um, one of his um, adult ensembles performing via video. Now, this uh, particular um, uh, thinking, reviewing this particular project brings to mind uh, the question, what about the age barriers in Second Life? And there are ways to work around the fact that we don't want uh, younger children in Second Life, even though there's much content that they might enjoy and benefit from, because just like uh, the internet at large, there are dangers uh, uh, there is inappropriate material uh, for younger, younger children. And uh, so what we've done is that we've had 
performances by young high school students done via video, so they're not really entering Second Life to perform. And they're viewing through a teacher's computer um, or through a online um, sharing uh, system such as um, um, live stream or Ustream video. And, um, and we also have created concerts for young audiences that are attended by their teachers and then the teachers share their screens with them in the classroom. We once did a, uh, a whole uh, school district in Poland with a Polish speaking violinist who shared uh, the, the room was filled, uh, the virtual room was filled with about 30 high school teachers who then shared uh, their screens with classrooms of, of students and they funneled questions back and forth. Another professional development outcome for musicians that, that um, are in Second Life is um, the networking for collaborations. Um, well, the audience might be small, uh, all you need for a, uh, a successful outcome of a networking is one key partnership that you develop that you couldn't develop any other way. So um, we found that music careers can be enhanced greatly by just one significant connection that's made internationally. And uh, because of the international uh, nature of Second Life at every concert, when we say, where do you folks come from? We typically get 12 to 15 uh, nations that of uh, people attending. So the opportunities to find those significant um, collaborations and opportunities is, is greatly enhanced in virtual reality, especially for those artists who are uh, out of the mainstream, who are living for whatever reason in uh, smaller centers. So the kinds of things that we've seen is um, a duo from the east coast of the, of the U.S. They formed a great friendship with a, uh, a similar duo from the west coast. And they not only became uh, personal friends and collaborated within Second Life, they actually teamed up and did a, uh, a concert tour together. And uh, an electroacoustic uh, musician from Denmark uh, met a, a U.S. colleague who uh, was working on similar types of music, but they had slightly different skills. And they were able to team up, and uh, and the U.S. colleague, um, uh, Cypress Rosewood in, in uh, Second Life, was able to bring Torben Ass from Denmark uh, for a Nashville concert. And Torben has done several tours out of the, um, the contacts that he made uh, through uh, starting with Cyprus. And the Swiss professor from uh, Freiburg that I mentioned before uh, became uh, 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 connected to an Italian pianist, uh, Alexandra Marangoni, who is from uh, a Naxos recording artist, and uh, Alex uh, visited his conservatory and provided uh, some uh, uh, master classes and um, uh, training for young students that were at the conservatory. Um, several other examples were uh, uh, a U.S. ensemble. Uh, was facilitated in touring Italy, and uh, a North American debut of a concert pianist was arranged uh, on a, a chamber series here in Toronto. So within the context of all these kinds of developments, there was a great deal of professional development that was facilitated within Second Life. And I just want to share with you now a little video, which was made by Alex and Tom uh, in uh, Tom's uh, home studio when Alexandra was visiting Switzerland. 
And what you see here is not a concert. You can see there's only two or three avatars standing around. And those are, in fact, the three avatars belonging to myself, Kate Miranda, and to Tom uh, Dowd, and to, uh, and to Alex, who is Benito Flores in, in Second Life. And we're just testing the video stream and seeing how everything's working before the concert. In addition to the professional development for professional musicians, virtual reality does have affordances for audience development, um, music appreciation classes that are unique to the platform. Musicians and music educators do have the long range goal of turning on new audiences to uh, different music styles and they do find virtual concerts very rewarding for those purposes because when we poll the audiences there's over 80% says that they've never attended classical music or music of whatever form that we are presenting at the time. They're within virtual reality, they're more willing to try new things. So it's very, uh, it's a very uh, ripe audience for uh, talking, convincing, uh, trying new things. Uh, and some activities that we use in music education in real life actually work better in virtual reality. Um, I know that uh, as a, a former orchestra manager, um, we're often, we often try to build on educational events onto rehearsals by offering open rehearsals, but it's very difficult to make them interesting because audiences struggle to understand what's going on. We don't want to lose the uh, rehearsal time to a lot of interruptions for the conductor or musicians to explain what's going on. And audience members are kept uh, at a distance so they won't interrupt and so therefore they have difficulty hearing. We've had open rehearsals in Second Life where we have mic'd the performers and put headsets on them so that both hearing what they're saying and uh, the ability for them to speak and offer um, comments is greatly enhanced without, without interrupting their rehearsal time. Works much, much better. And um, so virtual concert, concerts in all have a really great uh, potential for um, informing the community for outreach for audience development purposes. There's also a, a unique uh, way of teaching music appreciation, which we've developed at Music Island, which we call guided listening, because it's not really a music appreciation class in the normal understood sense. We have a wonderful guest lecturer, quite a snappy dresser, don't you think, um, who's a, uh, a guest speaker often at the UK Recording Society. He's the president of a local recording society and he has a massive classical music collection. And every month he puts together a series of uh, uh, listening, one hour or so of listening. And he creates uh, note cards for himself and also spontaneously types in comments. And so what you have is we all sit around and we are listening to his wonderful selection of, of music, which might be other Christmas Oreos beyond the Messiah or some such topic that he's chosen. And we're listening to the music and on it, without interrupting the music, we can also read comments which he has put into the chat stream, which says things like, uh, here we hear the theme from the first movement begin to be repeated, but here it's in a minor key or something of that nature, which is so much superior to the usual music appreciation class where the, the person delivering the lecture tells you to remember 
10 things which you're supposed to um, be able to identify as an uninformed music uh, member of the music audience. And, uh, you know, it's very hard to keep those 10 things in memory and you're not sure you're hearing what you're supposed to be hearing or was that it two bars ago and you missed it and so on. So this is, uh, this works wonderfully well and it's quite enjoyable. The music's not interrupted and uh, you learn to listen. Another way that we have been using um, virtual reality in what is called mixed reality con concerts. Mixed reality is uh, something like the, um, the event that you saw where there's video streaming of a concert, uh, but it, it adds the element of connecting live and virtual audiences. By adding a virtual component to a concert that's being subsidized by a live concert activity, you have a better business model than you can by trying to do things just as a freestanding uh, virtual concert. When you're talking about something like the Lead Symphonia concert that we did with an entire orchestra, there would be no way of getting an entire symphony orchestra together simply for doing a virtual concert, unless it was some one-off promotional thing where somebody was going to invest the $16,000 that it might take in musician fees to um, pay the, uh, the, the orchestra for that, for that, uh, that's, that session. Some immersionists in virtual worlds kind of dislike streamed video because they are trying to immerse themselves totally in this world that is a world of avatars and virtual objects. And all of a sudden they see a projection of the real world and it breaks the fourth wall in some way for them. They just don't like it. We found that if we add avatar performers in front, even if they're volunteers, or we have a, a, a master of ceremonies uh, who is kind of an interlocutor between the world, it helps bridge that, that gap. But there's some people who are just never going to like that within the virtual community. Missed reality con concerts do uh, have the benefit for the virtual world and for virtual music of promoting awareness of, of virtual concerts, uh, however, and of publicizing to music educators and performers that this world exists and what they can do within it. One of the ways that I have most recently presented a mixed reality event was with uh, Christine uh, Caulfield, Christine Montgomery in Second Life, who performed a work, uh, Aid Alive, as a part of a presentation at the Toronto-based TransX uh, Symposium. Uh, sponsored by New Adventures in Sound Art in 2014 at the Witchwood Barns. And um, this collaboration involved a real world um, 2012 uh, uh, Olympics in the UK um, cultural project called Sound Spiral, which is a 48 bank speaker uh, independently controlled speaker system embedded in the walls of an inflatable, which has been used for everything from rock uh, concerts to sound art to new music uh, installations to audience awareness events. Um, so uh, Christine was working in the real life sound uh, spiral. I created a sound spiral uh, within Second Life that you see in this slide. And we, um, and as I was presenting in Toronto, we had a new, we had a 
uh, a second life audience which you don't see in this picture because I was just too busy presenting this was just my setup in, in advance and I had two screens in virtual reality and I had two screens in the the real audience in uh, the conference and we were sharing um, Christine uh, playing in re in real life on on video and and Christine uh, playing in the virtual uh, space and um, we were able to ask questions back and forth and the whole thing was actually also the sound part was being uh, broadcast out on FM radio which was a curve that they threw me at the last minute. Uh, actually, and I had to rejig my uh, sound setup real, real fast to go to one channel where I'd been planning on two. But that, that's, that's one of those things that happened to you. Um, but this was a, this was, this is just a demonstration of the way in which you can use um, uh, mixed reality as a music educator. Now, in professional development, another way that we find that musicians are using um, Second Life is, is keeping some secondary skills sharp, which include using a secondary instrument or a style of music that's not part of their current career. So, for example, we had a, um, a violist who was a principal um, violist. So here's an North. example of a not possible in real life event. <laughs> and what here's we did another in this concert uh, view of um, um, that particular this was another that particular not show possible you... in real life event uh, here's there another live, not possible uh, sculptor. in a real life example and we'll cut to the video of There's that endless opportunities was... for inventive people to think about ways there are of opportunities for lifelong audience. learners in second life and it's good to remember that not everyone performing it so to conclude, we want to talk about how it all works, and this could be a so whole different presentation. So you might be watching these videos and say, well, how do I capture Second Life videos? So I thought I should tell uh, you that 